All right, family, let's open our Bibles up tonight to the book of Genesis, chapter 9. Genesis, chapter 9. You know, I know some of you, when you hear prayer requests and, and people opening up their lives and being real, um, maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're going, that's really cool and I should have done that. It's okay that you didn't, you know, because maybe that was just a layer in your life of the Lord breaking some things down and building some courage and boldness for you to have a moment like that where the Lord would minister to you and speak to you and, and have that. It's just part of the process. But that's one of the beautiful things about the body of Christ, isn't it? Don't you love God's people? I mean, when people go, I can't stand to go to church, but you don't know the church. You don't know his bride. I mean, it's like, that's what I'm looking forward to heaven. It's just like we get to like fellowship with everybody all at the same time. We won't be limited with these minds and time and all that, right? It's going to be incredible. But meanwhile, we got this opportunity to press in. Man, when, when the service before it begins, there's opportunity. When it's over with, don't rush out the door. Go with love on somebody. Go pray for somebody. It might have been someone to go, I was going to ask for prayer, but I didn't quite have the courage. That might be the person you walked up to and say, hey, how you doing? What can I pray for you about? It might have been that guy or that gal, right? Versus, wait, i got to get home to my TV show or my pot roast. Really, come on, press in to that. And, and when that's, that's how we have Holy Ghost encounters and miracles happen because lo- it's all about love, right? So understand that what we're about to do, this Bible study, this is not the meat of why we gather here. It's just not. It's about people loving on each other in Jesus' name. This is, you know, if, we're just, if this is the meat of it, then we're just getting big heads, big deal. We, we got plenty of that in the church. People loving each other. So take that as our little mini sermon devotion tonight. Amen? Okay. Let's go stand and and, uh, devote this to prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us tonight in his word. Father, thank you for the brother, the sister next to us. We thank you, Father God, for the transparency in this room tonight, for the walls that were broke down, chains were broken. We, We prayed it, we sang it, you did it. Thank you, Lord. We ask that tonight as we open your word, God, that our faith would be increased first and foremost to know who you are. So many of this room think we know who you are, but we really don't. Not really. Not near to the level of how powerful and how loving you really are. So may you take us further tonight in the love of God. We ask, Lord, that as we go through the scriptures that, Lord, your word would just penetrate us. And that you would take us to a place, Lord, where we could truly be empowered to walk as Jesus walked. And we pray this for your glory and for your pleasure, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, look with me at verse 16. Kind of a little bit of a spring into our last part of the chapter 9. It says, verse 16, the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature and all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These Three were the sons of Noah, and from these whole, from the whole earth was populated. Stop there. Gives us some insight, kind of where we're going to in the latter part, where we deal with the curse of Canaan tonight. We know in our story that Noah has spent a year on a big boat, waiting upon the Lord to bring deliverance, because he brought deliverance from judgment, but bringing deliverance into a new land, a new chapter in his life. Noah gets off the boat, and God says, I want to make a covenant with you. And, of course, we have the account of the first rainbow, because there had never been a rainstorm before that, right? So here he looks up at this rainbow, and God says, this is a sign of a covenant between you and me that I will remember. Now, a lot of people go, well, why did God need something to remember. Did he forget? Was he worried about maybe he'd go, I'm going to destroy them. They're just ticking me off. No, I forgot. I said, I wouldn't do that again. The rainbow. Okay. It's not God helping him out with a faulty memory, is it? It was a sign for us that God was having this agreement 
that he was not going to destroy the earth in, in that particular way. And when we know that the book of Revelation talks about the judgment will come on planet earth and it's going to be laid bare with fire. The prophet Zechariah tells us as he prophesies end times that a man will be standing on the ground and the eyes of his socket will be vaporized. Sounds like a nuclear bomb, doesn't it? The earth will be judged, but God says, I'm not going to do it in this way anymore. Now, what is this way? What does it really matter whether it's water or fire? Because there's going to be a new covenant that's going to take place. Don't you like that word, new with covenant? So here is Noah having this new covenant with God that's being established. And God says, I'm going to have this and a sign with it. And then it's time to start a new life. Now, it says that Noah had three sons and that all the offspring of the earth would come through these three men. One of the things I like about that text is it tells me, really, we're all related, aren't we? We're so segregated, so separated, so, you know, divided, like, well, you know, you're Oriental and you're Latina and you're this. Man, we're all coming from one atom, if you would, right? But we, so that's why I love heaven's a picture of all nations, tongues, and tribes coming together. Amen. You know, that's why I like when I look around this church and I just, I see so many nationalities in this body. I've visited churches where everyone's black or everyone's white or everyone's a senior citizen. All you see is either shiny heads or gray hair all over the place. <laughs> and I go, what is that? That's not a picture of God's order and God's kingdom, is it? But man loves to divide things. Well, we understand this. Here God is going to bring this temporal division in the sense of that there's going to be different offspring from the sons of Abraham. But before this population starts, before this increase of humanity on earth takes place, something happens with Noah. Now, Pastor Jacob read this last week, and I'm not going to get too, too deep into it, but it's important that we understand the context, again, before we get into this end result here. Look with me here at verse 20. It says, Noah began to be a farmer and planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both of their shoulders and went back and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away. And they did not see their father's nakedness. Stop there. Now that's where we left off last week. If you missed last week's study where Pastor Jacob talked about how love covers sin, you can check that out online. Important aspect of that story, which I would love to cover, but it was covered last week, so you can check that out. We're going to go somewhere a little different as far as the insight of the scripture. What I want you to understand is the setting here where basically the earth is going to be repopulated. God establishes a covenant. And there's going to be a grace period of time before he destroys the earth again. Not in that fashion as we know another one. But in between, there's going to be this opportunity for blessing and for cursing. The book of Deuteronomy is big on that, blessing and cursing. And now the population is going to be increased to where all these dynamics are going to take place. And it's all going to happen through these three sons. So to start off the scene, the first thing that Noah does is he says, I'm going to be a farmer. Now, he doesn't go plant potatoes, not apple orchards. He decides to plant a vineyard, something you can get drunk with. And that's exactly what he does. Now, why are we talking about that? Well, why, why would Noah get drunk? I mean, here he's this man of God. I mean, separated from the world in the sense of, man, the world's got judgment, but Noah, chapter 6, you found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Noah, and you and your family shall be blessed and enter into the ark, a picture of being chosen to come into Christ. Wow. And here you see God do amazing things, spare you the judgment, provides the, the dove, the olive branch, land, the whole thing, and then you go off and get toasted? What's the deal? I mean, men and women of God don't do that, do they? Men and women of God don't sin, do they? They do. We do. I do. But why? I mean, why would he do that? I mean, you would think that if God was speaking to you in such incredible ways and doing miracles, and he wiped out the whole earth, 
and then you're going to thank him for his mercy by getting a six-pack or a bottle of Jack? What's the deal, Noah? What was going on in him? Probably the same thing that goes on in you and me when it just seems like the whole world's falling apart and we want to run to something and we want to do this thing called Medicaid. Now, if you're a teenager here, you call it Xbox, right? Or maybe my boyfriend or my girlfriend giving me props and telling me I'm just as hot as can be, you know, <laughs> right? I feel so good about me because they can't take their eyes off me. It's all about me. I feel good. That's a drug for real. It is. And so whether it's pornography, whether it is relationships, flesh, worshiping of flesh, whether it's materialism, or whether it's alcohol, we do things because it feels like things are falling apart, they're out of our control, and we want to numb ourselves to the reality as we perceive it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, now there, here's the deal. There's a ramification for this. There always is. Ham. Ham, why would you do that? Why would you see your father in a tent drunk out of his mind, passed out, laying there naked. And then go make a spectacle of him and humiliate him. That's pretty messed up, isn't it? Yeah. Now, some scholars, and we should cover this, some scholars take to that word where it says, and saw, and they interpret that in Hebrew as that Ham actually had a homosexual act with his father. Some have interpreted it like that. Because of the Hebrew word, there's some connotations there that it can kind of possibly maybe mean that. I think that's a bogus interpretation because why would he sexually assault his dad and then run and go get his brothers and show him? That doesn't quite make sense, does it? So if you hear, because if you're in, some of you are in Bible college and you will hear that about Genesis, I think it's ridiculous. Just saying. But the bigger question is this, is why would he diss his father like that? What was going on between Ham and dad? Because Japheth and Shem, their heart was, man, we want to honor our father. We want to love our dad. We kind of see that with teenagers and kids today, don't we? There are some kids, I love to walk up to a kid and go, hey, so what's it like having this guy as a dad? And some of you, I've done that with you. And, and some of the kids don't really give a flip one way or another. Like, <laughs> dude, you're so weird for even asking that, you know? <laughs> And that might be true, <laughs> but I love to watch reaction. But every now and then, I'll get, awesome. My dad rocks. That is so cool. That's a Japheth Shim response. What would a Ham respond, I wonder, if we could have walked up to Noah on the boat before they got off the boat and said, yo, Noah, what do you, hey, Shim, what do you think of this guy as a dad? Well, Shim was the youngest, Right? most likely didn't get most of the attention because usually dads are investing in their firstborn because they're going to be leading the family, right? So usually the young ones are jealous, like the story of Joseph, right? And it, it, so I don't want to read too much into this, like I'm some psychologist and inject too much into this, but just common sense, there was a problem in the relationship between Noah and Ham for Ham to do what he did, you don't need to be a prophet to figure that out, right? So something was going on here, and Ham had the opportunity to capitalize on whatever wickedly was going on in his heart to cause a problem with his dad, and he did. But Noah really blew it. Because while he was feeling the weight of the world that fell apart around him and not knowing where he's going, I guess I'll become a farmer. It's not like I can be an auto mechanic or I can do this or go down to this village and horse horseshoes or something. I mean, there's nothing, man. What am I going to do? Talk about a career challenge, right? And so he's going through a lot and versus cast all of his cares in the Lord, he decides to get drunk. There's a price when you do that. Now, see, we know from last week, hey, check it out. And you read in the chapter, Noah died living almost 1,000 years, man, and he, and he was in the hall of faith as a mighty man of God. Thank God for grace that he found back in chapter 6 at last through eternity, amen? Yeah. But that didn't mean there wasn't ramifications on earth, though. See, I can go get toasted or go get wasted or fornicate or do whatever, and if I'm saved, it doesn't mean I'm going to lose my salvation and go to hell. I'll still be covered by the blood. But that don't mean there's not going to be ramifications here on planet Earth because believe that there are. 
You do. It's exactly right. You reap what you sow. And so here, him drinking because he doesn't know how to deal with his stress levels, his fears, his failures, whatever it is. And as parents, guys, we go through this condemnation. Man, I should have loved my kids more. I've been harsh with them. I've been judgmental. I've played Holy Spirit, spiritual abuse. I've abandoned them. I've chosen my career over them. I feel guilt over that, but I'm locked in because what am I going to do? I'll lose both my two cars and my beautiful house if I stop doing what I'm doing and then spend time and invest. And we go through these things, and it's kind of a subconscious thing where it eats us up alive. Now, some of you kids here today, you can hear that and go, I didn't know that's what's going on with that jerk I call my dad. I had no idea. I just thought he was a jerk. The way you're making it sound, I almost feel bad for him. Good. You know, we don't realize it. We don't understand. And so, as a kid, you know, we got to step back and go, man, so maybe there's pressures and difficulties and challenges going on that, that I don't really understand or know about. Maybe I should just go talk to my dad or talk to my mom. Are you ready? talk to that authority in my life. Ham had an authority issue. An authority issue. Let's keep reading. Verse 25, then he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. Stop there. Now, this is interesting because here, think about this. Noah blows it, allows the enemy to come in and cause a problem in his household, and man, the ramifications go on for thousands of years, even unto this day. And he, and he hears about it somehow. We don't know how he heard about it. He got it out of his tent. Somehow he found out what Ham did. And his response is not, Cursed be Ham, but cursed be Canaan, which was Ham's son. That can be confusing, right? Now, why in the world would Noah, with the prophetic voice, we're assuming for the moment, speak out a curse against Ham's son instead of Ham, when Ham is the one that walked in defying this authority, which is a big deal. We'll get to that in a minute. Why would the curse be on Canaan instead of Ham? Let me ask you guys a question. Bring some feedback. Consider this like to be a big living room right now. Yes, in the back there. Okay, so kind of like if I decide to never bathe or take a shower, my son's going to deal with my stink simply because he's my son. He's just going to have to pay the price. Kind of type thing. Any other thoughts? What? Yeah, why else? Yeah, Guy. Okay. Nathaniel? Read what you sow. Maria? Someone over here, yeah, pop. Okay. 
Okay. What do you guys think about that? That makes sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it seems some might want to interpret this as um, a generational curse thing, but the problem with that interpretation is that Canaan was Ham's fourth son, not his first. Okay? So this is not some generational curse, isn't it, which is a whole other, I would encourage you to read Jeremiah 31, where that whole idea of a generational curse, the, the scripture deals with that and says, hey, I don't want you to ever think that a son is going to pay for his father's sins. Um, very clear about that. He says, I don't want you to think that because the father eats grapes, his son's teeth are set on edge. In other words, he's going to pay the price of the bitterness because of the sin of his father, which is a great analogy considering we're looking at the fruit of the vine here, right? So but something else is going on here. This is more a prophetic insight, kind of anticipatory thing that would take place in the life of this line dealing with this authority issue that would take place. See, Canaan, all the offspring, the Gerbishites, the Hittites, all these tites in Canaan were going to be basically enemies of God, and they would have 400 years to repent before Moses came in with those that were taken, extracted out of Egypt and basically doing away with them out of the promised land. They'd have 400 years to repent of this polytheistic society of saying, we're going to have many gods. Do you know why people are polytheistic. You know why they pick many gods? Because they want to choose the God for the day and for the moment. They don't want an authority giving them direction in their life. And so they'll say, well, I like this God because we can fashion this God into our image. Let's make a calf. Let's make this. Let's make it agnostic. Let's make our God atheistic. Let's make, which is a contradiction, but they do. It's like, so we, we make all these multiple gods, so basically we can have a sense of, a false sense of security and worship and deity, because we're made to be worshipers. You know that, right? We're made to worship. We're going to worship something or someone. But when, we, when we're polytheistic and we worship lots of things, then we can say, well, I worship God because when I'm living this kind of life, this God fits. When I'm living this kind of life, this God fits. But it's really it, underlining a serious authority issue. See, the Bible talks a lot about honoring authority, doesn't it? Roman, Romans 13 is about honoring governing authorities. Honoring authority in the church. A wife honoring the authority in her home. Children honoring authority in their home with their mom. All this issue of authority and submission, what's it about? Is God a tyrant? Is that his deal? Or is it speaking of something else? Hey, how about going in deeper? How about Jesus honoring authority, but like a sheep before his shears was silent? Are you kidding me? God of all the universe that could wipe out everyone there in the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, and wipe them out, and he just submits to their order and their authority? Wow. Because his faith was in the Father, right? It's a sign, it's an indication of where our heart is really at. And so this curse that was going to be on Ham's fourth child, Canaan, this was a picture of this ultimately rebellious and, and archaic society of the Canaanites, this thing, we're not going to submit to the one true God. We're not going to. Now, anyone who submits to God, that curse, that block is lifted. Rahab was a Canaanite, wasn't she? So was there a curse on her because she was a Canaanite? No, it wasn't because she was a Canaanite. It was because basically if you were a Canaanite, meaning what that meant, that whole thread of what Ham was, rebellious to authority, judgmental, exposing of sin, all this, that basically you were outside of God's blessing and walking in a cursing. That's what it's about. Now, Galatians 3 tells us very clear, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the curse is lifted. There is no curse. So you don't need to walk around. If you've submitted your life to Jesus Christ, there is no curse in your life. Now, can you be demonically oppressed? Oh, you betcha. Oh, you bet. Read Galatians 3, you definitely can be demonically But that's not some curse from God. And it's not have some ramification because of something someone else did. Now, can there be influence in your life because of someone else's sin? That's what we're just reading about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, check it out. If, if I'm going to raise my family a, as a group of Mormons that will be gods one day, talk about a polytheistic society, you know, and I'm raising them that way, is there the curse of separation and under law? Absolutely there is. Can they repent? even though they're my child and not be cursed? Absolutely, just like Rahab did. 
okay? So why are we going on this road? Because I don't want you to interpret this scripture as, see, God cursed Canaan because of what Ham did. You're not reading the text right. And then you've got to ignore the number one, again, that he's the fourth child, not the first. Does that make sense? So it gives you some insight. Now, now he wasn't his only child, um, Noah's. What about the other boys here? This is awesome. Verse 26, and he said, blessed be the Lord, our Yahweh, the God of Shem. Shem means glory. Blessed be the Lord, the God of glory, and may Canaan be his servant, which is exactly what we saw happen, right? The descendants of Shem, Israel, went into Canaan after bondage to Egypt, and the Canaanites became slaves to those of the descendants of Shem, Israel. Amen? So all of this is prophetic, what would take place. Verse 27, may God enlarge Japheth. Ironically, that's what the name Japheth means, to enlarge. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Powerful verse here. Now, there's two ways you can interpret this, guys. This prophetic insight to the life of Japheth. Now, you've got um, basically descendants, and we're going to get into this more in the the chronology here in chapter 10 of who came from who and what line and where the Ethiopians came from and the Egyptians, and we'll get into all that when we go through chapter 10. But what you need to understand is basically the majority of the Gentiles came from Japheth. And here, this interpretation, some say, okay, well, God's going to enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. Shem being uh, the Semitic people. So you're going to go, some people interpret and go, so that means that, that Japheth will actually come under the covering of Shem. Now, some will interpret that to go, so basically, we're just a branch off the offshoot. God chose Israel, Shem, that his word came through, and he put glory into them. Shem means glory. The gospel, the truth, salvation, the Messiah came through, and Japheth, the Gentiles, came into their tents. They were, as Paul put it, grafted in. Now, that's one interpretation. And it's a pretty cool one, too. It, it, it doesn't really, doesn't, if that's your, your, your uh, stand on that, it definitely doesn't contradict the word, but there's another way to look at it here. It says, may God enlarge Japheth, and may he, not being Japheth, but God, May God enlarge Japheth, and may God in the tents dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan be his servants. In other words, God's glory is going to dwell within his chosen people. That's, and that's more likely, more commonly held amongst, amongst theologians, that that's the interpretation. But here God says, all this by grace. I'm going to call this people out. There's going to be those that are cursed that will not submit to me as their God, and they're going to pick and choose their gods and their direction for their life because they're going to do it their way, as Frankie's saying, right? And there's going to be the group of people that are Shem. They're going to follow after me and worship one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, right? And there's only one way to him. Now that's Shem. So if you believe that, you don't have to be an Israelite. You are grafted in, <laughs> you see? And God God says, and in that place that you come into, that's where my glory is. That's where my glory is. I want you to think about what would it be like if, and I would love this would happen, but if the glory of God that fills heaven, I mean, imagine. On earth we see a rainbow that's a sign of his covenant, right? In heaven, Revelation 4 says there's a complete rainbow around the throne of God. And his glory fills the temple in heaven. Imagine if we could all be like John and Leon of Patmos in the Lord's Day, caught up, and we just are enveloped in this glory. What would that do to you? It would change your perspective and your agenda in every way. In every way. The things that you value and hold dearest, it become different. The things you put your trust in, partially at times, it become different. You'd have a deeper rooted conviction that, Lord, I trust in you alone, and I look to you alone, and I will look to no other gods but you. If you, that's what happens. I mean, when you experience this incredible time, a corporate night of worship or something, and all of a sudden, two and a half hours, three hours go by, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was insane. Do you think about going and planting a vineyard? Do you think about going and getting wasted? 
Do you think about going and screaming at your spouse or lying to your boss or doing what? Do you think about that? <laughs> no, because the glory of God fills this place as you're truly Israel governed by his presence. It's incredible. Let me tell you what. And it's because you're totally, wholeheartedly submitted to him. That's where we're supposed to be. And if you're living like that, there's no curse. The curse thumb comes from rebellion to his authority as the ultimate and only authority in your life. There is cursing there. It doesn't have to be so. And check it out. You can be a child of God and experience this. Look at Noah. Can you imagine what this was like? Here, I love my son, and he's totally humiliated me and dishonored me. And then to watch what takes place as offspring, that there's this cursing and a whole group of people that basically want to kill God's people. And contrary to God's law and his order and his kingdom, that came from my loins, says Noah. Are you kidding me? We don't want that in our life. So here's the question tonight we want to think about. What are we producing with our life, with our choices, with our worship, and what we're putting our trust in? What are we producing? Parents, we got to think about that. I know that it comes down to where everyone makes a choice for themselves. I can't make someone follow God, and I can't make someone rebel against God, but I can have influence. I can. My choices influence people. They affect people. And if I'm choosing to worship something other than God, medicate on something other than the Holy Spirit, there's direct effect on people around my life and ramifications that will come from that. We learn this from the story about Noah. And I'm not putting this guilt trip on anybody and go, man, so my kids are the spawn of Satan and clearly it's my fault because look what I've done, you know? That's it. You know, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, amen? I mean, you're walking in the spirit, you're trusting God. Yeah, you're gonna fall down and mess up. Even though Noah did, he was still in the hall of faith even though he produced a ham, right? Even though he blew it and his sin, but his sin didn't create the sin in Ham's heart, it just gave Ham the opportunity to capitalize to express that wickedness that was there. It wasn't Noah's fault what Ham did. So some of your parents are living under condemnation and going, it's my fault. See, I wasn't there for my kid. Man, that's a lie from the enemy. Each person is accountable to God for their own sin. Don't you think for a moment because you messed up, it's your fault, and all the Canaanites are coming as a result of you blowing it as a parent, it's all your fault. The enemy's lying to you. Don't think that. So be able to compartmentalize to go, yeah, I'm going to own where I blow it and where I trusted in a vineyard and I trusted in medicating and I trusted in worshiping something else for God. You know, I'm going to own that, but, and I know that affected people and stumbled them, but I'm going to repent of that, and God doesn't hold a record of wrongs, and I'm going to move in and learn forward, but I'm not going to condemn myself for what Ham is doing and what Cain and Noah is taking place. Release that to the Lord if you're carrying that burden tonight because that's the Lord putting heavy weight on you that you're not created to carry. Seriously. And that's not just for parents, that's for people. We carry all this condemnation and we go, wait a minute, Lord, you told me that you take my sins and you cast them as far as the east from the west. It's kind of crazy how that can be true, but there's still ramifications of my sin. But see, this, and I want to close with this, this reminds you of something called grace to go, okay, I see the ramifications of my sin. I see the ham, I see the Canaan, but you tell me I'm forgiven him for it. So I see it, but it's just a reminder that you've forgiven me. It's not something for me to feel guilty or condemned over. Guard your heart when you see the fruit of your screwing up. When you go, oh, I blew it, I rebelled, I rebelled against authority. Let me tell you what, just own it, repent, be in agreement with God that you're going to submit to his order and not mix in your own, your own ideas. And as far as the bad fruit from it, go, hey, Lord, I know you can work it out for good just like you did with the Canaanites. You use them to bring sanctification in your people, conquering Jericho. Wow, you really do work everything out for good. I look at my kids and I go, man, I worship ministry over worshiping you, Lord. And I sacrificed them on the altar many times. Totally blew it. And so when they were going through prodigal times, I was going, oh, it's my fault, Lord. And then instead of really owning it and getting healing from it, I become more controlling. Am I speaking to any parents here tonight? You know I am. You, hear, you know the Lord is. Hear that. So I would sit there and go, oh, that, that's how I'm dealing with it. Because I'm going to make sure to redeem this situation. I couldn't redeem anything. I'm a loser, okay? 
He's the winner, I'm the loser. I just want to hang out with him and be a winner in him, amen? It's like, I can't do anything. So I start to learn, oh, it's by grace. You forgive me for abandoning my children and worshiping a foreign God that I slapped a fish or a dove on and called it you. You forgive me for that, Lord, in the ramifications of their hardened hearts towards you and towards church and towards me as a dad. You're gonna fix those, Lord. You're going to take care of that, and I'm going to trust you, and not, I'm going to stop playing Holy Spirit and watch you move in their lives, Lord. I, I can't fix that situation. And then I'd watch as I step back, him soften their hearts, and their faith become genuine in being a Christian of worshiping him, not because they're supposed to, because their dad's a pastor. You see? He worked it out really good, and he's still working it out. I'm still a mess, so are they, and so are you, Right? right? We're all still growing. So if you mess up and you build a vineyard a couple months from now, you know, get a cup of coffee, <laughs> repent, and learn more about the grace of God, right? He's not condemning you. He loves you like crazy. He really does. How good is that? How good is he? Amen? Yeah, let's all stand together and commit that. Father, thank you so much for the patient dad that you are with us, that though, Lord, we go off and, and dishonor you, dishonor authority that you put in our life to help us, though we choose drugs, sex, alcohol, fame, this world, Lord. We choose it over you when you're so much better. Thank you, Lord, for being patient. Thank you for not rejecting us when we come to you a stinking mess. God, you're so good. Thank you that you've removed the curse through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we've inherited a blessing by grace through faith. We ask your blessing on this time of fellowship tonight, Father God. We love you, and oh Lord, we love your people in this room. Take down any walls of division, any barriers that we put up, whether it's culture, language, personality. Lord, we just want to be one in you with your people. So may you bless this time with an incredible covering of love in this room to care about others more than ourselves, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And every saint shouted, Amen. Amen. God bless your family.